Okay, so. <laughs> so we are. Um, we're going to have about four hard days this week of at least just getting through the things that I had overviewed for you on Friday. So we're going to start with that. Um, this was the cover of the thing that I was showing you that you had to read for today. Um, everybody know what that is? Yeah. All right. Well, we're certainly, we're going to look at Age of Anxiety art as we go along with it, but it falls into a larger category called modernism. 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 Yes, really, art has is a one gigantic category that starts roughly in the 1860s after realism, and it's called modernism. And then a whole bunch of different subcategories fall into that. The subcategory for this, Edvard Munch, The Scream, is a, is a category called German Expressionism, where the art itself really is expressing the emotions uh, of the painting. And so this one is my favorite because I think it's the best visual representation of what it might have been like for the intellectual community after World War I. Um, this is kind of the place where you're in the middle of the crossroads and some of them are just kind of screaming because they don't really know what to do next. All right? If you go into your notes section, all right, there is a, it's kind of scatterbrained, but you'll notice one of them is called Age of Anxiety Intellectual History Notes. And that's what we're gonna be looking at today. Um, and then remember I said over the weekend, hopefully you had an opportunity to start reading that alternative chapter called Alternative Chapter. Um, the very first thing that's on here is this character named Paul Valerie, uh, who was a French poet um, and kind of gave a little bit of an overview, a perspective of what was taking place among European intellectuals. And, it, it predates World War I. So, I mean, some of them are, are writing as early as the 1850s. But when you put it into a, a large category, it ultimately becomes Age of Anxiety. He says this, and this is just kind of, uh, it was apparently published in Variety magazine. He was a poet. Uh, he gave speeches. He wrote essays. He contributed to, you know, just contemporary literature, that sort of thing. And he said, one can say that all of the fundamentals of the world have been affected by the war, or more exactly, by the circumstances of the war. Something deeper has been worn away than the renewable parts of the machine. You know how greatly the general economic situation had been disturbed, and obviously the post-war era is not great economically, and the polity of states and the very life of the individual. You are familiar with the universal discomfort, hesitation, and apprehension. But among these injured things is the mind. The mind has indeed been cruelly wounded. Its complaint is heard in the hearts of intellectual man. It passes a mournful judgment on itself. It doubts itself profoundly. That's a pretty good statement. And this thing called cruelly injured mind is part of it. Because what it's talking about is what I mentioned on Friday is that there is no longer a belief system that they can hang their hats on. That's what we were talking about with religion being the belief system really from the fall of the Roman Empire until about 1648. And then at least the comfort of knowing that, that when that belief system was shattered, there was something to take its place. And that's when they embraced science and then science and, and physics and the age of enlightenment and the age of reason reason was there to kind of pick up the pieces and say, okay, well, we're good because we still have a universal belief system, all right? This one's actually going to be better because it's based on our own ability to observe and make sense of the world. The scientists have kind of given us a, a nice, uh, easy, you know, like, thing to, a template to follow using inductive and deductive methodology. We can discover the laws that govern nature, and that if we're really on our game, we can discover the laws that govern universe or uh, human society. And so 1648 to 1918 is this pretty good march forward. 
saying that science has replaced religion, we are on this road to progress, it's optimistic, there are certainties that we have about this world, um, this age of reason or whatever you want to call it, and then it all kind of comes crashing down. Now it's wrong for us to say that intellectual Europe or whatever it is had to wait for World War I to happen to start reacting to it. That there were, uh, the majority of these writers were writing way before World War I. It's just that when we start compartmentalizing like we do in history, to say there is a segment of the population that is already starting to um, undo what we believe to be true. All right? Nietzsche writes in the 1870s and 80s. Kierkegaard writes as early as the 1850s. Dostoevsky is writing in the 70s and the 80s. All right? Freud is writing turn of the century. Sorrell is writing turn of the century. Bergson is writing turn of the century. But it makes a heck of a lot more sense if you understand that the age of anxiety, even though they have already kind of planted the seeds, that those seeds start to bear fruit. We say the Newtonian revolution occurred in the age of Newton, knowing full well that Copernicus, Brahe, Kepler, Galileo had been planting seeds. They just needed to bear fruit when they bared fruit. They make, it makes a hell of a lot more sense after World War I. Okay. So I mentioned yesterday that the first piece of what we were going to look at was a deconstruction of what we held to be true during the Age of Enlightenment. And so the two foundational pieces that we're going to look at first are science, because science was the bedrock that explained everything else, and the second is psychology, or at least the notion that man was inherently rational. That's what gave us this idea of the Age of Reason. And that piece by piece, those notions would de get deconstructed, and that's where the scary parts come in. Okay? So I'm not much of a scientist. I'm not very aware of how to explain, you know, electron microscopy and all of these other things. But this is how it kind of plays out the way a European history teacher would tell you how it played out. All right? This is what was true about what they believed to be the Newtonian view of the universe. There were some accepted facts, okay? And that each of them in one way or another was going to be destroyed, all right, undermined, uh, called into question by the 20th century physicists. The first is this, that says time, space, and matter were objective realities that existed independently of the, of the observer. Right? Anybody ever have hear that thing where you say, if a tree falls in the middle of the woods and no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound? I never got that. I hate that. It's yeah. a great philosophical query, but it was, it was based on the idea of whether you buy Newtonian views of the universe or whether you buy Einsteinian views of the universe. Okay? If you are a Newtonian, you'll say absolutely. Okay? Because you could witness while you were there a tree falling in the, in the woods. You hear it every time. So you, you, you know, speculate out that, yeah, if I'm not there, it would make the same sound, just I'm not there to hear it this time. Right? That's what they believed. Okay, yeah. Like, we just talked about this in physics today. Yeah. And Winchester said that it doesn't make a sound because sound is a human perception of vibrations through air molecules. Right. So yeah. And that's what Einstein would say is that you cannot divorce, <laughs> you cannot divorce the human experience from those objective realities. They are entirely subjective because there is some type of integration of you doing the hearing of that thing that's taking place. And you could say the same thing about time, and you could say the same thing about space. All right? But up until then, you're damn right. If that tree fell, it made a sound. Okay? Does it make the same sound to a chicken? I don't know. Ask a chicken. <laughs> right. The second, the universe was a giant machine whose parts, I know that a vacuum makes a different sound to me than it does my dogs. Alright, because I've been vacuuming for the, the entirety of their lives and they still try to bite the vacuum. Right. So I know that sounds different. Okay, the universe was a giant machine whose parts obeyed strict laws of cause and effect. Okay. 
movement, uh, the rotations around of the Earth's axis, the ro revolutions of the planets, the falling bodies, everything had a logical mathematical explanation. The third, the atom, was a basic building block. Uh, block. It was indivisible, it was solid. Okay? It is the smallest thing and then uh, of which other things are built. Four, heated bodies emitted, re emitted radiation in continuous waves. And then five, the big one, through further investigation it was at least possible to believe that you could gain complete knowledge of the physical universe. All right? And there's a list here of people with different discoveries, Rentgen's discovery of x-rays, the discovery of radium, the work on radioactivity, the discovery of the electron, the discovery that the nucleus itself had electrons moving around it, much like uh, the sun had a, a system of planets that revolved around it. The idea that the atom could be split, the power of neutrons, the idea that that neutrons could pass through other particles. All right, all of that stuff. You know, all of the things that are ultimately the discoveries that would get them to the place where they could do atomic research, subatomic research, and then develop the atomic bomb. Okay, all of that is undermining some things that were true about atoms. Okay, or true about energy, or true about being able to map energy. You know, to predict. You know where a particle would be from one second or one split second to the next. Okay, um, that's what's taking place here. So the Rutherfords, the Max Planck's, what quanta theory is. You know where you I, the idea of like a, a particle it moves along and you kind of have it like you know some like old cartoon you know group of like Flintstones. You know they're driving along the road. All right, that it, 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 there's a certain like A point and there's a certain B point. And if you say it starts out at A, traveling at 400 miles an hour, it will arrive at B at X, right? And that the discoveries of quantum theory and particles of light and other things are moving so rapidly and are moving in discontinuous ways where there could be short, very quick bursts of energy and then there can be kind of... Um, slow and more methodical burst of energy that you can't follow it. It'd be like trying to guard Steph Curry. All right? You know that Steph Curry like dribbles the ball and as he's dribbling he's going to get to the hole at the same point if he started at half court, if he ended up at the rim, you could say that Steph Curry it takes him two and a half seconds to get from half court to the rim. He does it every single time. Instead of Steph Curry slow dribbling and then all of a sudden exploding and then stopping and then exploding again. All right? And never doing it the same way each time. So the arguments there are that these are um, things that cannot be known objectively, cannot be predicted. You could, you could talk about probabilities, but you could never talk about it's going to happen this way, mark it. Okay? They can't do that now. And the discoveries of these scientists were more or less suggesting that. Einstein's the one that really screws up the, the objective reality of the tree falling in the, in, the, uh, in the forest or whatever the case was. There was one that they did, it was called the train analogy. Has anybody ever seen this one before? No. That's a train, this is a track, this is an observer that is like off in the distance, maybe like sitting on a rock and observing the train that's going by. And then the idea is, is that it's a passenger train, like an Amtrak, and that the person in the back of the train gets up and walks forward towards the front of the car. How far have they gone? Mm -hmm. And the reality is, well, okay, from this person's perspective, they have gone as far as the train has traveled from one place to the next. The reality of this person is I went from the back of the car to the front of the car. All right, Meaning that the human experience and the way that they... Uh, interact with those environments determines time and space and matter. Okay, and then they did some other weird ones. You know, like you put two people in a spaceship and they travel like at the speed of light, and then when they return, one person has aged like 256 years. Everybody they've ever known is dead and has been gone for like six or seven generations. But but for them, they feel like they've been gone for two years. It's pretty tricky. It's way trippy. Okay. 
Yeah, in the tunnel. Where yeah. well, if they close the doors to the tunnel and the train does fit in the tunnel from the person on the train, from but from a bystander's perspective, the train doesn't fit in the tunnel. But the tunnel doors are closed. Wait. So there's a. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> like I said, it's the worst um, physics of my life. <laughs> so anyway, it says, For Einstein, neither space nor time had an independent existence, neither could they be divorced from human experience. He rejected the idea that space had a distinct physical reality, that it was a stationary medium through which light traveled and matter moved. He rejected the notion that time was fixed and a rigid framework that was the same for all observers and existed independently of human experience. It, there, the quote was, it was formally believed that if all material things disappeared out of the universe, time and space would be left. According to Einstein's theory, however, time and space would disappear together with those things. Okay. So this is just like taking five, you know, laws. This is, this is the reality. For 300 years, this is reality. And they just took a chisel and said, chunk, that's gone. That's gone. That's gone. And what sucks about it is it's science. You know, the thing that's not supposed to be speculated upon is the very thing that they say there's no proof of any of this. So you're you're destroying a foundation uh, with 20th century physics. All right. And if that is supposed to be the the bedrock of which everything else was created, the Age of Enlightenment was using science as that's the, the starting point. We use the laws that we know to be true and that if we're good, we can discover the laws that govern human society and we can perfect that. Okay, So let's look at that notion because that was the other one that we talked about. Remember I said that a hundred times. All right, There are certain things that were just true and one of them coming out of the Age of Enlightenment was man's inherent rationality. That was the locks response to the Hobbes, or the response to uh, really the age of religion's belief in man's sinful nature. If man is sinful, is a creature that is, you know, is subject to the temptations of the devil, or Eve, or the apple, or, you know, Jewish conspiracies to poison drinking wells and devour children in rituals, okay, all of that stuff um, gives impetus or gives motivation for people to control other people. All right? They can't be trusted, therefore we've got to have control over them. All right? If you start from a different baseline that says man is inherently rational, um, and that if there is any evil in the world, or if there's any poverty, or if there's any destitution, or if there's any oppression, or whatever that is, it's because there are artificial barriers that exist and that dominate institutions that create flaws in those institutions, and therefore, it, perceptively, it seems like there's flaws in humanity. So if you could reorient those institutions, fix those flaws, you put perfect man, inherently rational man, into those perfect institutions, progress, perfectibility, utopia, whatever you want to call it. Okay? But it was based on that idea. You, you heard me say that a bunch of times. All right? the, in, the, the inherent state of mankind is rational. They generally do good. If there are flaws in the world, they are due to the faultiness of the social environment that man interacts with. If you can fix that environment and fix the structure uh, that orients that environment, you can perfect humankind. Okay? And then Freud and others come along, and Nietzsche, and Bergson, and Sorrell, and others, and say that's ridiculous. Okay? There's almost like a little ping pong match that's going on. You got the scientific revolution and the age of enlightenment, and then after that, maybe around the time of the French Revolution, romanticism kind of hits back and says, you know, this uh, humdrum kind of existence that you've created with man and reason and looking at law, nature as something that we need to discover the laws of and saying, that's stifling. It's taking away beauty. It's taking away love. It's taking away passion. You know, it bummed the poets out. 
And then the scientists came back and said, you know, but look at all of the things that we've achieved, obviously. And now Darwin comes along, and Marx comes along, and August Comte comes along, and a second industrial revolution comes along, and they're like, science! You know, and then Europe is killing it, you know, in, in terms of their, their time and place in the world. But then it all starts crashing down. Remember that you know, Darwinism begets social Darwinism and racism and anti-Semitism and competitive nationalism and imperialism and alliances and all of a sudden World War I and <laughs> destruction. But before that we even got there, there were Freuds and others that were looking and saying, wait a second, man's inherent rationality. Hmm. And some of the studies that were done, those of you that are taking AP Psych, you probably know about this stuff, right? Anybody in AP Psych? No? Okay, well, it's coming. <laughs> All right. So, has anybody heard of these three things? The id, the ego, and the superego? Yes. yes. Okay. So, if you were looking at the Age of Enlightenment version, okay, the ego is sort of a a reasoning mechanism that is present in the human psyche or whatever. Okay, You receive information from the outside, you put in some kind of rational calculus, and then you respond. Okay, Easy peasy. Freud introduces a couple of other concepts to say that the ego finds itself caught between two very, very powerful forces. One is the id, and the other is the superego. What is the id? I think he refers to it as a cauldron full of seething excitations, constantly demanding gratification. You want to see an id in its most primitive state? Look at like a three or a four year old. <laughs> Play, fight, cry, eat. Whatever takes care of what you need right at this minute, whatever you're thinking, whatever you're saying, whatever you're doing, you are trying to satisfy whatever pleasure it is that you seek at that moment. Okay? That is the unshackled you. If there were no police around, if there were no surveillance, if there were no cameras, if there was no Snapchat, um, if there were nobody there to tell you what to do, nobody there to judge you, what would you do? <laughs> okay. Who knows? The sad part about it is is that you guys can't even get to that place because you've been so conditioned by the other part, which is the superego. The superego recognizes that these ids, these unrestrained desire to try to achieve pleasure in whatever way, and for Freud it was usually sex. All right? But it could be hunger, it could be whatever. Whatever your energy needs to like get out and do. They believe that if people are channeling nothing but their id, that society's probably gonna be in pretty rough shape, okay? So we put some kind of cap on it, all right? It says, human beings derive their highest pleasure from sexual fulfillment but unrestrained sexuality drains off psychic energy needed for creative, artistic, and communal life. It also directs energies away from work needed to preserve communal life. Hence, society through the family, the priest, the teacher, the police, imposes rules and restrictions on our animal nature. That's the thou shall not, okay? Your parents, you're like, you know, I want food. No, 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 you can't have food yet. Like, I want to watch TV. You can't watch TV because you haven't finished your homework. I want to throw cookies at my brother. You can't throw cookies at your brother because you'll get crumbs all over the table. Your brother will cry. It's a waste of food. And you're going to create animosity with your brother. Okay? School sucks. I want to run out the window and I want to go out and play. You can't. Because school is a necessary prerequisite for you to have a job so that you can help support communal life. You understand? So that even if you you don't have people like all up in your business telling you what you can't do, all right, eventually you start, it's almost like your inner self 
starts to buy into it. Like, I don't need, like, you get to a stage in early in life, you have those people all up in your face saying, no, I can't do that. But now you get to this place in your life, and maybe later where you say, no, I can't do that, I've got to study. The SAT is going to be in a couple of weeks. All right? I really ought to be doing spring break the way that spring break needs to be done, but I can't because I've got this thing coming up. Right? So then, they say that's the part where it becomes almost un unbearable. Like the, the demands and the way that the superego tends to override. This is from a work of his called Civilization and Its Discontents. All right. But it's literally saying that you're driving people crazy. Because the superego has literally nullified every opportunity for your id to be able to play. One place that you can play is your dreams. Okay? But then even dreams, you wake up feeling guilty that you had the dreams that you did. Okay? Or you can even see, like, the superego, like, like involving itself in your id dream. All right? And then there's no place for you to go. And that's what they say. That's why people get off kilt. They get depressed. They get neurotic or whatever the case is. All right? So Freud, unfortunately, Freud sees uh, he sees civilization as an unnecessary or as a necessary evil. Okay, um, he gets it. He understands, you know, why people are, you know, are crazy, are sick. He explains that rather than man being inherently rational, it's a battle. It's a battle. It's a constant fight that the rational is playing against society's impositions and the irrational, which is where all the good stuff is. Okay? Where all of the energy is. Okay? And ultimately what he believes is real sad about it is, is that the, that stuff can be channeled in a way that is productive, but instead people almost, it's almost like they give up on it. Nietzsche, on the other hand, it would agree with Freud that it's a freaking battle and that the superego has overwhelmed the id, okay, and it's turned people into sheep, the herd-like masses, all right? The meek shall inherit the earth. The first group that he went after uh, was organized religion. And so they took everything that was heroic and valuable in the world and they subverted it and made all of those things that used to be virtuous turn them into vices. And then humility and all of those Christian values ended up becoming the dominant paradigm and all the old like warrior values of old times, uh, they became sins and they became vices that needed to be stamped out. He said that bourgeois society, you know, where you give, like, the masses the right to vote and everybody's equal and all of that other stuff. He said all that happened was liberal bourgeois world uh, subsumed uh, the, the, the Christian value system, but it still is, is making, um, you know, the leaders or the, the true, uh, the people that could rise above the herd, it makes them sort of like the enemy says you need to conform, you need to be like. Okay? So Freud says it's necessary, and Nietzsche says uh, it would be really sweet if some people could finally step up and have the courage to say, I'm not doing this. I'm not letting the superego deny uh, what I can be in this world, and that he considers it valor, he considers it heroic for somebody to be able to stand up amongst the herd and say, I'm not playing this anymore. What they all have in common, though, is that the irrational drives people's impulse, behavior, uh, pleasure, uh, instinct, passion, that those are the things that are really, you know, th that's the stuff. Just like the Romantics did. Okay? That, that this default idea of man's inherent rationality is, is just, is, is sad. And it's not true. And it's, it's making people miserable. So here's the other group that I wanted you to look at, and these are the what we call the mass psychologists. 
Okay, and each of them is in the reading. I'm going to deal specifically with Nietzsche and Bergson and Sorrel tomorrow. Uh, but this is a group uh, you'll at least see the names. But it's looking at the dilemmas of modern life and some of the things that we've been talking about. Um, the alienation and despair that people feel. Uh, the, the fact that, like, bourgeois individual life, you know, the focus on the, this freedom and this freedom and this freedom and individual rights and individual this and individual that has taken away people's ability to be able to connect with other people. They feel isolated in the world. They might have more freedom and they might have more material things, but they feel isolated. And when you're in a very vulnerable place where a lot of society was right around the end of World War I, you're looking for those things. You're looking for those connections that have been taken away. And if you took God away and you took science away and people are out there like monking, you know, they're, oh, what do I do? And somebody comes along and says, follow me. I will give you the things that you desire. You feel like you're not connected to something that's bigger and better and something that is greater than yourself. They took your God away. God was a way that you were able to share an experience with other people. Okay, They took that away from you. Now it seems like they're taking nationalism away from you. Okay? Now it seems like they're taking science away from you. There's no universals. There's no way that you feel like any of this matters. Well, I'll make it matter for you. And there's all these mass psychologists that are coming around and they're talking about society being in the place that it is and warning and saying, these things are going to go bad because... First guy that's on there, his name is Emil Durkheim. His work in 1897 was called Suicide. Says he's an important founder to modern psychology. He attacked uh, the bourgeois world of the 19th century with its focus on individualism believe that in traditional society the social order was derived from God and persons, place, and function were determined by birth and custom. However, modern people, skeptical and individualistic, did not accept those restraints. The dilemma, therefore, is that modern people suffer from a condition of anxiety based, pre based primarily on the fact that traditional values have collapsed and no one feels integrated into a collective community and therefore feel no real purpose. And this leads to a great number of suicides. He studied it. He was looking at places where the material life was so much better than it might have been at the beginning of the century, but there was these gigantic spikes in the number of suicides. He's like, well, why is that? And that's what he came up with. Durkheim focused on a cru crucial dilemma of modern life. On one hand, modern urban civilization provided the individual with unparalleled opportunities for self-development and material improvement. On the other, the breakdown of traditional communal bonds stemming from the spread of rationalism and individualism produced a sense of isolation and alienation. And like I said, that sense of isolation and alienation is the stuff where the Hitlers and the Stalins and the Mussolinis, that's where they can play. There's all of these people out there that are desperate to find something that they can hang their hat on and here they come. Okay. It says 20th century totalitarian movements sought to integrate these uprooted and alienated souls into new collectivities. A proletarian state based on worker solidarity or a racial state based on ethnic purity or nationalism. The next guy that's on there, I won't get into the details, but is he's a German sociologist by the name of Max Weber. I introduced him much earlier in our course because in 1905 he wrote a work called The Capitalist Ethic, which looked at how capitalism had risen at around the same time that Calvinism was taking hold in the 16th century. And that there was a, like a structure around Calvinist ethics that sort of congealed um, with capitalist stuff. You know, especially like that, you remember we were talking about like the early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy. Well, that these are, these are kind of like Calvinist things, you know. The good, stern, moral, pious person that doesn't spend money they don't have. They don't go and blow their money in the tavern. They don't live sinful and decadent lives. Right. They invest in their futures. They try to take care of their children. Okay, that those are capitalist practices. 
A penny saved is a penny earned. A stitch in time saves nine. Okay. Um, the other thing that Weber was talking about was the idea of charismatic leaders. Okay. Again, looking at the irrational in social life and the power of the irrational, um, but that, that dislocation, that alienation that people felt, the void gets, gets filled by these charismatic leaders. And they could be anybody. Right? He said they could be war heroes, they could be religious prophets, they could be uh, sports heroes, they could be celebrities, they could be politicians. Like even in the United States, you had, you know, like Huey Long and, and people like that that came along and got really, really big followings. All right, um, and he says people yearn for charismatic leadership, particularly during times of crises. The leader claims a mission to lead the people during the crises. The leader's authority rests on people's belief in the mission and faith in the leader's extraordinary abilities and that they dedicate themselves to whatever that cause is. All right? They don't arrive at that by rationality. They arrive at that based on sentiment. I feel like they're going to be able to do what they say they're going to do. Okay? Um, you don't get there by you know, analyzing policies or things like that. All right, the last three guys that are on the list, one is Vilfredo Pareto. This one's a little harder, uh, but he's talking about um, that what people normally do, what, what drives them to act is emotion or is sentiment, but that after they do what they were planning to do, they take some kind of like joy in giving it some kind of logic or reasoning. So they carry out an act. That act might be like, I want to bomb Iraq and replace Saddam Hussein. And then they go back and then they try to put in some kind of structure to say Saddam Hussein was supporting um, Al-Qaeda or Saddam Hussein uh, was a villain that was gassing his own people. And that that stuff was the logic that was applied after the fact. Okay? So like he says, um, they are purely instinctive actions, although the man performing them experiences a feeling of pleasure in giving them quite arbitrarily logical causes. Right. The next guy is Gustave Le Bon. His work is called The Crowd. And he's looking at people going to rallies or people that go to concerts. He's answering the question, why when, you know, I don't know, Metallica's playing on stage, does some random person throw a bra? <laughs> Or somebody decide, I'm taking my shirt off and I'm dancing. All right. The answer to that is looking at almost like a collective hypnosis that takes place when individuals, which by themselves can be rational or reasonable people, but when they get into crowds, they go nuts. All right. They... They're, they did studies on it. There was one study that was done that was un unbelievable was this critic of Hitler that had gone in, you know, like Hitler's crazy, Hitler's anti-Semitic, uh, you know, how is he able to convince all these stupid people to go along with his ideas? And then these folks will go to a Hitler rally, like maybe a rally that took place in the early 30s or whatever, and they'll get there and they watch these people and after the end by the end of the rally they're sig hailing and they're doing the chants and everything else it's like i don't even know who i was in there all right guys that dress up like i don't know like the, the offensive linemen for the washington redskins back in the day they were called the hogs so these grown men would dress up as pigs and they would, you know, paint their faces, and they would oink every time, you know, like somebody got a pancake block on somebody on behalf of the Redskins. You know, these are normal people, maybe accountants, you know. But on Sundays, on Sundays they are pigs, okay, that oink and then throw beers at each other, okay. 
But it says the activity of the brain is paralyzed in the case of the hypnotized subject. The latter becomes the slave of all the unconscious activities of his spinal cord, which the hypnotizer directs at will. The conscious personality is entirely vanquished. Will and discernment are lost. All feelings and thoughts are bent in the direction determined by the hypnotizer. And the people that are, you know, the, the musicians or the, the political uh, figures that are on stage, the great orator, you know, whoever it is, can transform those crowds. Uh, they can do it into joy, into anger, whatever it is. They can get them going. Okay. And, I mean, anybody that's watched rallies in the last couple of years knows the power of that thing. The last guy that's on the list, and we're just about to run out of time, is Jose Ortega y Gasset. This is a Spanish social critic and psychologist who wrote a book called The Revolt of the Masses in 1929. The only thing that you're really going to need to know about this is that he talks about the tyranny of the majority, that you're dealing with mass movements here. Okay, the Nazi party was not an elite, like a small group of elites, like old authoritarians that were designed around monarchies and a handful of high-ranking aristocrats. These are big movements. Okay, the Bolshevik party, um, the uh, the fascist party in Italy, um, Franco's fascist party. These are mass movements, and the scary part about mass movements is that. They tend to look at those that don't support the masses as being the enemy of the people. And so minorities end up sticking out and they are the subject of very, very uh, concerted attacks. Um, and that's the danger, they call it the tyranny of the majority. Okay. And usually if you looked at Germany or Italy or the Soviet Union in the 30s, they figured out who those folks were that didn't uh, didn't necessarily represent the will of the majority, and terrible things happened to them. All right. So everybody kind of see how this stuff works together? I know it's a lot of stuff, all right? but remember, the, the first thing that we were really looking at was that they were deconstructing things that were just accepted to be true during the Age of Enlightenment or the Scientific Revolution. That piece by piece, they're just blowing that stuff up. And there's nothing left behind. And that's what's scaring everyone, is they don't know what to believe in. All right. Tomorrow we'll get more into the intellectual crossroads, or certainly by Wednesday we'll get into the intellectual crossroads. I do want to talk about Bergson, Sorrel, and Nietzsche, but they're more or less telling us a lot of the same things that we've already looked at. All right. But it's just a couple of pages uh, in that alternative chapter that I gave you. There's a big section on Nietzsche, there's a section on Dostoevsky, then there's one on Bergson, but it's about six, maybe seven pages, if you take a look at it. All right? I only have about ten people that haven't turned in last Wednesday's PSDs. Um, I will put up the, uh, the thing that I said I was going to put up about the seven seconds. All right, and then we should be good to go. All right? Is there any homework for this week besides that? That's pretty much it, other than to keep up with the reading. Okay. Yep. Stop. <laughs>